In this video, I'll show you how to solve the Alex problem called calculating the heat of reaction from bomb calorimetry data. So buckle up, this is actually a pretty intense problem. It's not super hard, um, but there's just a lot of calculations that you need to do in order to answer the three questions that are being asked. So you're gonna notice with this problem that you've got two different scenarios, two different reactions taking place in a bomb calorimeter. Um, we've got the first scenario, and then we've got the second scenario here. And you're, you're gonna notice that these do involve two different types of molecules. It's not gonna be the same molecule molecule each time. This first scenario that's being described, this process is going to be used to calibrate the bomb calorimeter, and we're going to be using this to find the value of the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter, big C. And then once we do that, um, we're going to be able to apply that information to the second scenario. All of the questions down here at the bottom pertain to this second scenario, but we can't really start solving it until we find the value of the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter. The equation that we're going to be using um, to solve this problem when we're, when we're working with a bomb calorimeter, the equation that we use is QCAT. Q equals C delta T, where Q is the heat that is being evolved um, or absorbed by the reaction. And that's going to be in either joules or kilojoules. It looks like in this problem, we're working with um, units of kilojoules. C is that heat capacity um, that we're uh, the constant for the bomb calorimeter. Delta T is going to be the change in temperature for the bomb calorimeter. That's going to be the final temperature minus the initial temperature of the calorimeter. So um, for this first scenario, again, our job is to use this data here to find the value of C. So what I'm going to do is take this equation right here, and I'm going to rearrange this equation algebraically to solve for the variable C. Um, that's going to give me C equals Q over delta T. Q is the heat and delta T is the temperature change. So looking at this data, let's actually um, start by finding Q. So to find Q with this data, you're going to have a heat of combustion or something like a heat of combustion. You're going to have something that has units of kilojoules per gram or joules per gram. And you're also going to have a mass of the substance that was placed in the bomb calorimeter. So we're going to use these two numbers together to solve for Q which is in units of either joules or kilojoules. For mine, it's in units of kilojoules. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna work this, I'm gonna work this math out down here. What I'm gonna do is take my heat of combustion, which is 26.454, that is kilojoules per gram, and I'm gonna multiply it by the mass of this particular substance, which is 7.5 grams, and when I do this multiplication, that gram unit is going to cancel out. I don't know what I wrote kilogram here for, kilojoules. Gram, gram unit will cancel out, and I'm just going to be left with units of kilojoules, and that's going to be my value of Q. When you do this, just make sure you're being careful because you do have two masses in this problem. Make sure that you are massing up or, or um that you are matching up the mass that corresponds to the heat of combustion. Okay, so let's do this uh, first calculation. 26.454 times 7.5 is 198.4, and that is units of kilojoules. That is my value of Q, 198.4 kilojoules. And then I'm going to divide that by my temperature change, delta T. My temperature da change data is right here. Uh, and temperature, the temperature change is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So we're going to want to read a little bit um, to see T final minus T initial. So it tells me that the temperature rises from 10 degrees. That means that that's my initial temperature. It goes to 44. That's my final temperature. 44.69 mi minus 10 gives me a delta T of 34.69, and that is in degrees C. So that's my delta T, 30, 34.69 degrees C. And again, the reason why I'm doing this is to calculate the value of the heat capacity for this calorimeter. Um, so we're gonna divide 198.4 divided by 34.69, and that is 5.72 kilojoules per degrees 
Celsius. So again, the, this whole first set of data right here, the only thing that we're doing with this set of data is using it to find the value of the heat capacitor for the calorimeter, and we've got that. And I'm gonna highlight it, and I'm gonna get rid of the highlighting on this stuff right here. And we are now ready to move on to the actual problem itself. So we haven't even really started solving the problem yet. This is actually the problem that Alex is asking about. So now it tells us that we're gonna take a different substance, put it in that same calorimeter, the temperature changes, and um, it's asking us, is this reaction exo or endothermic? What is the value of Q? And what is the value of delta H for this reaction? So um, first, is the reaction exo or endothermic or neat? Either, and I don't think that this is ever going to be the correct answer. In an exothermic reaction, the temperature of the bomb calorimeter is going to go up. In an endothermic reaction, the temperature of the bomb calorimeter is going to go down. And again, this question is pertaining only to the information in the second situation, right? So we are not, all of this stuff up here, we're not paying attention to it anymore. It is not relevant to us anymore. We're not focusing on it. So let's take a look at our temperature data. It says that the temperature of the water rises. That means the temperature is going up. That means that this is an exothermic process. And again, I don't think that neither is ever going to be the correct answer, but a neither answer would come if the temperature didn't change at all, if it didn't go up or didn't go down. Okay, so if you said it's exothermic or endothermic, which we did, calculate the amount of heat that was released or absorbed. That is given to us um, by the symbol Q. In this same, we're using the same equation again, um, Q cat. So we're solving for Q again using this exact same equation. This time we don't know what Q is. We can calculate the delta T because we've got temperature data and we also we know what C is because that's what we did to start the problem off. We solved for C. So I'm going to solve this calculating for Q. I'm going to solve it in this space right here. Um, Q equals C delta T, my value of C is 5.72 kilojoules per degrees C. And then my delta T, that's my change in temperature, final minus initial. So my temperature change for this set of temperature data, T final minus T initial is 62.16 minus 10, which is going to be 52.16 degrees C. 52.16 uh, and those those uh, degrees Celsius units cancel out when we solve this problem we are going to be left with units of kilojoules 5.72 times 52.16 is 298.3 kilojoules and that's going to go ooh, that's gonna go right here. Do wanna double check and make sure that the unit uh, that we calculated, that, that came out with our calculation, make sure that that's consistent with the unit that Alex wants and um, it says round to the correct number of significant digits. Oh my goodness, what is the correct? So we've gotta look back and see what the correct number of sig figs are for this problem. It looks like, um, you know what, I'm not, I'm not even, I don't even really care that much about it. We'll, we'll come back and look at the sig figs later. I'm going to keep four sig figs on there right now. 2.7, 2 298.3. I'm all shook up about the sig figs. Okay, so the way that this particular problem is worded, the way that Alex um, is, is wording the question, calculate the amount of heat that was released or absorbed. Because of that wording, released or absorbed, Al Alex wants this to be expressed as an absolute value. So whether you calculate a negative number or a positive number, in this part of the problem here, you should always be expressing this as an absolute value, just a positive number. So for the last question, it's telling us to calculate the reaction enthalpy uh, per mole of C2H2. And you got to really be careful with this last problem because some of the ones that I looked at, this is, I think it was like a really dirty trick of Alex. Um, some of the problems that I was looking at, I was asking you to calculate the delta H for a substance, not the one that was actually being described in the problem. So I looked at one problem where it was asking me to calculate the delta H of one of the products of the reaction, which is super weird. And I'm gonna show you how to do that just in case that's what you're looking at. But do look really carefully at what Alex is actually asking you about. Don't just automatically assume that it's asking you about the molecule that's being described in this particular scenario. 
Okay, so the reaction enthalpy per mole, that is going to be the value of uh, delta H is going to be the value of Q over the number of moles of whatever this particular substance is that Alex is asking us about. Uh, it's going to be the value of Q for the calorimeter or that you get from that QCAT calculation. So it is going to be the 298, in my case, 298.3 kilojoules. And then down here, it wants uh, me to fill in the number of moles of C2H2. And I'm going to get that by just doing a nice little gram to mole conversion. I've got the molar mass of C2H2 already looked up is 26 grams per mole. And so I just need to convert that 5.78 grams into moles. And I will squeeze that calculation in right here. 5.78 grams of C2H2 times one mole of C2H2 over 26 grams C2H2. 5.78 5.78 divided by 26 is 0.2223 moles. And we're going to plug that in down here. We're going to carry out this calculation. 298.3 divided by that number of moles. That gives me an answer of 1,342 kilojoules per mole. So for this answer down here. This answer does need to have the correct sign, meaning it needs to either be positive or negative. If you said that your substance was exothermic, then this is going to be a negative delta H. So if it's exothermic, then negative delta H. If, uh, if exo, and if it's endothermic, it's going to be a positive delta H. If you have a positive delta H, Alex doesn't want that positive sign in there, but just know that it's a positive number. So uh, whatever you um, choose, exo exothermic or endothermic based on the temperature change, make sure that you put the correct sign in question number three. And I think, that, like I said, it's really dirty of Alex to ask for an absolute value here and then ask for the correct sign in this bottom spot. Okay, so before we finish, what are you going to do if, like what would we do if Alex was asking us down here to calculate the delta H um, per mole of H2O, which I did see, like I said, I did see an example of this problem where it was asking us to calculate the delta H of the product, not calculate the delta H of the molecule that it actually gave us information on. What would we do in that case? So if that was the problem that you were looking at, you would still do all, all of this. You would still go through all of these exact same steps. You would get to here. This is, I'm gonna erase it, or I'm actually just gonna move it. This is, I'll move it down here. The delta H, the kilojoules per mole of C2H2. And what we would need in this case would be the kilojoules per mole of H2O. So you're going to have to add in one more step, a stoichiometry conversion, where you convert out of moles of C2H2 or whatever molecule you're working with and into moles of whatever Alex is asking you for, moles of H2O. Now you wanna set it up like this. You want the, like in my case, I want the moles of C2H2 to cancel, so they need to be on opposite sides. And like I said, this is a stoichiometry conversion. So we're gonna to go to that equation that Alex provided us and we're gonna get the stoichiometric coefficients from that equation. Uh, I kind of picked a bad one um, because the stoichiometric coefficients are both two in this case. But whatever those coefficients are, you're going to fill those coefficients in and you are going to carry out the math. I, I really don't like the fact that it's not going to do anything. So let's say it was asking us to calculate it for CO2, which is our other product, CO2. Um, and change that to CO2 also. And then we'll change this to CO2, and then that's going to change that stoichiometric coefficient. So we're just adding the stoichiometric coefficients from the equation, and so that we just have one more step in this calculation, times 2 divided by 4, and that is going to be, that would be uh, negative 671. Okay, so in terms of sig figs, because Alex is not giving us any kind of information about the correct number of sig figs, if I'm looking up at this, it looks like I'm limited to four sig figs. It looks like that's what I'm 
working with here. So I should have four sig figs. And I maybe did some weird rounding up in this spot. I definitely rounded to less than four. I'm pretty used to Alex asking for, um, or Alex actually saying what how many sig figs there are, so I don't think about it that much. But it looks like I do want four sig figs in all of these answers. So this this answer here, if this was my question, it would be need to be 670 Point nine kilojoules per mole. Good luck on this problem. Uh, it is, it's pretty intense, but the calculations aren't that difficult. I know you can do it.